Welcome to Through the Wire. Through the Wire. We back, we back, we back, ladies and gentlemen. We got a starting five today. Five Chicago boys. We're here with Shams Charania. Welcome to the show, man. Man, I appreciate you guys having me on, Kenny. It's a long time coming. Of course, of course. Great meeting you three as well. I have a lot of respect for what you guys do. So thank you, thank, thank you. you. We thank have a lot you. of respect for what you do, man. man. Your job don't seem easy. The grind. Yeah. <laughs> and we <laughs> also, before we get anything started, because KB, I know you got to do that, the mm-hmm. housekeeping stuff. We have to have a certain respect because you here in studio. Yeah. yeah. Every interview we've had, the, the Anthony Edwards one was um, on location. In Utah. Yep. Yeah. Um, Zach Levine was on that. A bus. The, the <laughs> bus thing. Literally. It was the hoop bus. Gotta get it. Gotta get it. Cold yeah, bus, exactly. too. Yeah. Very it was cold. No heat. Cold. Um, <laughs> Derek Rose was via Zoom. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think everybody, Emmanuel Quickly, Sadiq Bay, all, everybody has been via Zoom. Am I right? Uh, correct. I don't want to have true. And Ron Artest, I mean, Metal World Peace was also at location. On location. And Jamal yeah. was on Jamal location. Murray yeah. was. But usually Jamal we, Crawford, got, we had to go Crawford. somewhere else. <laughs> yes. Shams pulled up. Yeah. To the stoop. Hold up. Well, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the shy. So <laughs> That's what's up. Yeah. Right. Best yeah. city Especially there is. You guys being Chicago boys, and I know, you know, it, it means a lot to have people come through the studio. So mm-hmm. hopefully, first mm-hmm. of many. First of many. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Set that precedent. So let me remind y'all to leave a like on the episode. Subscribe to the channel if you're new around here. If you're listening to audio platforms, go to the YouTube channel. Subscribe. If you're on the YouTube channel, go to the audio platforms and hit like and pre-download. And we got a live show, May 19th, in the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. The link will be in the description. That's ttwtour.com. Completely free. Come in. Pack out the house. Enjoy the night. Someone asked me, are y'all staying after to take pictures and stuff? I'm like, come on. Of course we, we are. Do. That's we the best part. That's yeah. the best part. We fan love We've sure. never done a live show and not mingled with the fans. Just and like show love. We are. And we, are we do sure. more than just take pictures. For anybody that's yeah, been to any of the ones this past year, whether it was, what, San Francisco, mm-hmm. L.A., Utah. I feel like in L.A. we spend more time mingling than actually per- yeah. performing. If you're going to yeah. be at the show, try to bring like a hat, something that, you you can get signed because every time somebody has sharpies and people want to get some <laughs> signed and it's like I feel like we signed somebody's shoe I signed some of like the weirdest thing yeah. I try to bring chest. something try to bring a sharpie too it's, it seems like there's always like one or two you guys ever signed a, someone's forehead not the no. forehead. we're supposed to be no signing. body part you we're signed signing it before no. oh no, my no, god no, you want to you want to get this mic yeah far, okay today okay. we're supposed to be signing this for a fan it's a air, air it's literally an air fryer <laughs> we that's we signed this when uh. You mess with through the wire. You can win a, a air fryer signed by us. The story <laughs> behind this air fryer is Mike got a new apartment. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I'm going to give him a housewarming gift. This is what I got him. And instead of hooking it up in his apartment, he said, I'm going to give it away. But oh, listen, wow. though, <laughs> listen, though. As soon as he walked in, he's, he walked in my kitchen. He's like, oh, you already have an air fryer. And then I was like, I've been there for like a couple of weeks already. He's like, air fryer is a necessity right now. It's a necessity. It's People a necessity. use it all the time. So that's why they want you guys to sign it. Yeah. So yeah. they can think of you guys every time they use an air fryer, which might be every single day. Yeah. Now, what you could do to take it above and beyond. Is get this man to sign it too. I was going to ask him. Oh. I was oh. going to ask. Him. <laughs> <laughs> you know the price, <laughs> the value of the it. The value goes up. <laughs> you might the have value to keep for yourself though. <laughs> <laughs> so where, where do we want to start? You know where we start. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We we don't have to act different because Shams is here. Go ahead. Are oh, we giving the Lakers I a top of the really, show again? I thought he was going to uh, start talking about the Knicks, but we, uh, we can start on my Lakers. I think they had – that was probably the best game they played all series. To all me. year. Big I, win. It, it really That's was. That's a statement win. It really was. I think there was some small adjustments that the Lakers did that really kind of just gave them that leverage. First of all, it was we start with just Anthony Davis. I think it, it it's a lot of a lot of it is on his back because he's shown that he could dominate both ends on the on the uh, floor when he's on when he's on the floor and healthy. He could dominate both ends, and he could really just shut down teams. Like he held that team to like seventy points, and they they were uh, going into the fourth quarter. You know, I think uh, Desmond Bain, which was a big factor for Memphis, we were able to slow him down. He didn't have that type of impact. It was just the small things that the Lakers did that I feel like we should they should have been doing the whole time. You know, honestly, I, but they were able to pull it out. They got to look, you know, to the next series against Golden State or Sacramento. But it was a huge win. That game seven is going to be crazy. On I Sunday. cannot Man, wait. Man, I can't yeah. wait. I was there at game one. I can only imagine how game seven is going to be. I saw the ticket prices. and It's like, oh, yeah. It's like pricing the casual fan out for sure. You mm-hmm. you anticipated going? You wanted to go? Is that why? No, you I just always like to oh. look at ticket prices. Mm-hmm. I'm stupid like that. <laughs> this game was uh, frustrating though, because you this game shows just how good the Lakers can be versus some of the games where they played terrible. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. for so I think there's a big gap in teams of like their best and worst games. But it's just like when they're playing in their game, it's like they can compete with anybody. 
Yeah, I think when you look at them, it's like Anthony Davis really hogs that pain. He owns it. Mm -hmm. So it's like when he's healthy, it's like, is he probably one of the top rim protectors? I mean, Absolutely. He, he he's could do, he's he easily could, probably number one. I think he's probably number one when you talk about like bigs defensively. Giannis mm. is a two-time DPOY, and Anthony Davis can do every damn near everything he could do yeah. almost better when he's healthy. With him. But it's when just, he's yeah. dominant, this Lakers, I mean, that's why they have a cha chance to win a championship. Mm -hmm. When Anthony Davis is dominant, but you see that he ha whenever there's an off night for AD, it's tough for the Lakers to win games. So yeah. He's, yeah. when he's in that dominant mode, whether it's 25 points, double-digit rebounds, mm -hmm. blocking shots all over the place, Th this team is totally different. We know what LeBron is. I mean, D'Angelo Russell last night. Yeah, I'm sure D'Angelo Russell sure. was like a breath you know, of he, fresh he air. He had all the down series. Yeah. I think in game – Four, he had some clutch threes. The three threes, I think it was like three threes. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. But he's at, he had up and down series. But to come out, statement win, over 30 points, and then Austin Reeves. I mean, that the offense just flows when he has the ball in his hands. And, and yeah. to think about how far he's come mm -hmm. from last year to this year. You know, I interviewed him. He was like, man, I was buying Russell Westbrook body wash uh, <laughs> in, in, in training camp. And yeah, and I, he's like, I go places they don't even know I'm a basketball player. I, they think I'm, that's crazy. Now they know. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. now they'll know. Global. Yeah. And uh, it was a point where I think D'Angelo Russell. They just traded, and D'Angelo Russell went down with like an ankle injury, and they had him run a lot of point guard. And I feel like he got real comfortable just handling the ball and running the offense, you know, during that time. So it paid off. And yeah, you can tell that LeBron trusts him a lot. LeBron I'm trusts him for so much, man. bro. LeBron Thank gives him the ball down the stretch. Last he gives him the ball. In, in game one, he's <laughs> yeah. literally like passing him the ball. Yeah, he's literally yeah. giving him yeah. the ball. Yeah. Watch, watch yeah. it. I've never seen Especially like with young players. Yeah, like young players typically don't fit well with LeBron because he has such a, like the ball's in my hand, like you're not going to really get it much. So mm -hmm. like young players really don't develop well with him. Austin Reeves has done amazing. But Austin Reeves is also not a young player. He's a young in NBA, NBA years, years yeah. but he's actually 25 years old. Played through college, um, so I don't. I think he's more of the type of younger player that you would want next to LeBron James if you had to put a young player there. Somebody who's been through um, real basketball experience and not just some 19 year old who barely played college basketball. Smart, doesn't make mistakes. Right. Yeah. Right way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, what <laughs> I want to ask you <laughs> and. and in regards to the Lakers, how do you actually feel about the Lakers going forward in the playoffs? What's your stance on the Lakers as a as a whole? We know what they could be, what yeah. they should be, but how do you feel about the Lakers in the reality? I think the reality is the NBA is wide open this year, and I, I can't remember the last time. Definitely not since I've been a fan. I'm sure you guys, you guys are all young too. It's like same way since we've been fans. Like when I started watching the NBA, it's like three, four teams you know have a chance to win a championship. Everyone Absolutely. else. You c it's probably a dream, mm -hmm. let's be honest. Now you go into this year, if you're the Knicks, you feel like you can get to the finals. If you're the Heat, you think you can get to the finals. Every it's Obviously, Philly, we know about Boston mm -hmm. going into these playoffs. Cleveland felt like they had a chance to get to the finals. Obviously, Milwaukee felt like they had a chance <laughs> yeah. to get to the <laughs> finals, and maybe we'll talk about them at some point. But then you look out west. Every team that's standing right now in the Western Conference feels like they can get to the finals. So I can't remember the last time that, that that's happened. So if, AD say, if, if they're all healthy, mm -hmm. if AD's dominant, LeBron is LeBron, and they don't have injuries. I think this team can definitely get to the finals. I don't see why they can't. But, again, it's wide open. Yeah, I like that the Lakers kind of took care of business early because with them going up 3-1, it felt like game five LeBron was using that as a way to say, okay, game, we got two more. This is not a must win for us because in, in game five, it felt like LeBron wasn't really there. Well, he said he played like shit. He said exactly. himself. He did, so. yeah. But it also – we, we don't have to say it. He, 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 he said it. <laughs> yeah, so you know what I'm saying? Like five, I mean, five of 17 shooting 15 points. That's not LeBron. Yeah. It's not, not LeBron. LeBron. And a lot of those are three-point attempts. So, um, And then he came out in this game, and though he wasn't – the LeBron of 2011, he was hella efficient when he was getting downhill, he was getting to the basket, and it felt like that was the moment where we are like, okay, we're going to close this series right now because we definitely don't want to go back to uh, Memphis because that tra the travel alone for somebody of LeBron's age is like probably a lot. So I'm happy they got that series going, and I'm excited to see what second round looks like for them. Is it against the Golden State Warriors? Is it against the young Sacramento Kings who've been impressive? It's kind of um, crazy that it still is in Cali. Do you have – yes, the travel is going – like the lack of travel compared to like going back to, going Memphis. Back to Memphis. Yeah, because yeah. Memphis yeah. basically eat on East. Yeah. Oh, man, that's brutal. As a Laker fan, which team would you prefer to see in a seven-game series next? Mm, I can't believe you're thinking about it. Really? I think it's tough either Sacramento. way. You think it's Sacramento? got to be Sacramento. Because of the experience? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, either way, for both teams, I think that – you know, for the big man, at least, Anthony Davis has the advantage on both. Obviously, Sabonis has been an all-star this season, but 
you know, he's just shown that two. He could he could do it on both ends of the court. He can make it tougher to Sabonis and also you know guard him as well. Same thing with Golden State. Kevin Looney's been a monster, but as you got to talk about like they've been struggling. All, Golden State just struggled on the glass for against you know the Kings. That's them the reason the reason why they lost the game because they just gave up so many possessions. And it was no Sabonis practically. Yeah. I, Trey Lyle. Shout out to Trey <laughs> Lyle. <Lyle's man. laughs> <laughs> I would honestly I would say the Warriors. I think Steph Curry is. That he's the uh, most dangerous person on the court. They're plus and minus. With, with Steph on the floor, yeah. and not on the floor. Is, I mean, that's ridiculous. a that's a It's just yeah. Steph, alarming. Kalei, and everybody. You know, Jordan Poole. He's been in a real slump. I don't know when he's going to turn around. If he's going to be able to turn around this playoffs, but it's just like I'm looking. I think the the Kings from top to bottom, they're ready. You know, I feel like Sacramento is just like there's some question marks that they're still trying to figure out themselves. I'd rather take them on while they're trying to do that. The thing that scares me is that the on-off numbers. In the game seven, if you Steve Kerr, you're probably playing. Um, oh, he's playing the whole game. Exactly. You're going to play the whole minutes, game. Yeah. Yeah. He's some one minute every half. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what scares me if I'm the Kings. But the, the thing that I love the most about them is the fact that Sabonis has had a dreadful series for what we expected from yeah. all-NBA third-team caliber center. Um, and it's okay. He had five fouls in, what, 20 minutes yesterday. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Ended Trey Lyles. End up fouling out. Terrence Davis yep. off the bench, giving us quality minutes. Something that the the uh, the Warriors couldn't even prep for. He ain't played more he than a couple play minutes. He hasn't played this whole series. <laughs> yeah, he was expecting Davion Mitchell. Exactly. Um, so I'm I'm excited. I would like to see the Kings advance, but I've been very heavy um, rooting for the Kings all season. So I just want to see them win, and yes. then we could get the rematch from the early 2000s where y'all cheated them out of a championship oh. appearance. So we get that. From that standpoint, I think every basketball fan is rooting for the Kings. The story, the mm -hmm. feel. Um, the fact that they would be that underdog young team taking down this older dynasty that, you know, the basketball world has fallen in love with. But as far as really giving us a series, a storyline, and a battle, LeBron James and Anthony, Anthony Davis and co. against Steph, Steph Clay, um, Dre, and co., um, I, I think that's just – that's different. We haven't seen LeBron and Steph since, since the, the finals. Since the yeah, finals. Yeah, so I think that would be something. And I think the Warriors will make the Lakers work. Um, the Lakers, they give up leads. And when you're a team like the Warriors, who are as deadly as they are from three, you're never out of a game. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of legacy stake in that. Um, and I think uh, I think, I think they can expose certain things in each other a lot better. Because like you said, Anthony Davis is going to be a handful for Kevon Looney. Um, but I also think the, mm. the intricacies – of the Warriors' offense is going to be trouble for y'all because y'all don't like to communicate, don't we like don't. to get back That's on defense, and the, you won't depend on Anthony Davis to clean Desmond up everything. The Desmond Bain games, he was running around screen. It's not like he was just cooking and step back, and he was just – we didn't communicate enough to go around double screens or pin yeah. down screens, but – that's that's the type of stuff I'm worried about with, with Golden State when it comes to that. It's just like they do all the – like they're just play so – when they're rolling, they play in such unity. Mm -hmm. It's just like, wow, how are we going to stop – I don't – the Lakers have played really good defense, but it's just it's hard to match that. I think that um, it's just it's the I I don't I don't feel like the the Warriors is gonna be consistent as the Kings though, and that's why I'm kind of learning like I'd rather go against them. Yes, they can't get hot, but I've seen them just you know go cold, and I've seen them just have like bad possessions where they just don't look the same as the Warriors that they used to be. I got a question for all of y'all. Hypothetically, the Warriors take care of business, they win. Who is the best player? In that series, Stephen Curry. Steph Curry. Okay. Yeah. Without a doubt, it's still Steph Curry. Like Steph Curry. Okay. I was thinking you talking about. Nah, I'm, I'm, I hate making making picks. <laughs> they all hold, hold it on me. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I mean, yes, uh, yes. But like on any given night, AD to me is like the ultimate. Like he's a cheat code in terms of if he's on, if he's scoring thirty plus points, ten to fifteen rebounds, three mm -hmm. to five blocks, like you. It's almost impossible to beat the Lakers just because you know you're going to get other efforts. Um, so I, you know, that's another thing. I I really like the fact that he's been rebounding this year. Yes. Um, I feel like that's because why hasn't he ever been? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He's playing like he did in the bubble. I saw him in the bubble. Yeah. And he okay. was dominant down there. Like the shots was he like, was hitting, how consistent he was. He was he was never getting hurt. Yeah. It was reminiscent of like the finals against the Heat. I felt like um, the way he was just locked in. But I know I agree. It, when he's locked in, like two way, he, he and this is like his size he has and the way he can play is 
I think that gives like it's very limited players that can dominate a game like yeah. on both ends, and he has the tools to do so. Yeah, that's why me and you got into it a bunch of times because I had a little thing where I was saying us as basketball fans, we like the idea of Anthony Davis more than what Anthony Davis was giving us a few years ago, a couple mm-hmm. years ago. Um, and there was one point where Josh Hart was out rebounding Anthony Davis. Mm. And he was telling me that Josh Hart is supposed to do Josh that. Josh Hart out rebounds a lot of people. <laughs> that's a, that's a nickname. Now he's now. a nickname. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so he out rebounds a lot of people. Um, um, but can but we switch our gears and focus just, uh, just for a little bit on a team that was supposed to be fine in the West? For sure. Oh, no, for <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, they have a lot of – what are our thoughts on the Grizzlies? You, 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 what are your thoughts on the Grizzlies right now after this series going into the offseason? I, I think, I mean, John Moran spoke to it after the game. I think as an organization, Taylor Jenkins spoke to it during the during the series, saying, you know, the lack of maturity played a factor in this. John Morant spoke. So you don't even need me to, like, break any news here. Mm-hmm. There, there's clear that, like, off the court, the John Morant situation, things that went on there, they need to refocus on – on the task at hand on basketball and figure out ways to compete. Every every team's got their own things that they like to do off the court, but some mm-hmm. of the instances that came up, I mean, it's just hard to come back from. Yeah. Like having a guy like John Morant basically be suspended out of out of commission, out of play for a month of the season when you're going to the stretch, mm-hmm. when everyone's gearing up and you're without him, your leader. Um, that that was tough for the organization. Um, and I think now you go into the summer, Dylan Brooks is gonna be a free agent, mm-hmm. and. He averaged what ten points on thirteen shots a game. Yeah, and and poor uh, efficiency. Yeah, on the top efficiency of it. is just like the you antics. might throw up looking I, at it. I think, I think, I think Memphis is gonna have to look, and he's been a part of that core. When you think about mm-hmm. John Morant, Jaron Jackson Jr., um, and, and Desmond Bain, it's been Dylan Brooks has been in that core too. Mm-hmm. But I think this summer, if you're the Grizzlies, you have to reevaluate. Do you want to pay Dylan Brooks mm-hmm. it, it, the amount of money he might want? And then they have been active. Like, they made an offer for Mikael Bridges. They offered three, four first-round mm-hmm. picks for him. They've gone after OG Anunoby. So we've seen them be active in terms of going to get potentially a wing. So I'm very curious what move they make. I don't think they touched the big three that they have, mm-hmm. but they got to add one more piece there. That's yeah. my favorite part about a team getting eliminated is, like, we automatically look like, okay, what can they do to get better? And I think that's the obvious that's one. That's a good thing, though, right? right? It like is, for sure. Them, you know, we want them to be more competitive. Because they are – a very good team. There's no yeah. way you get to the two seed and go through everything back to back years, by back-to-back the way, years, right? um, without being good. But now, how do we get to great? How do we get to c- contender? Because I think for the last two years, even though they were one of the higher seeds, nobody was looking at them as like, that's the team we going to pick to win the West. And they have the potential to be that, but they feel like they're away from it. And I think that getting that extra wing and getting healthy, I think health played Steven, a big they part in this one. Steven Adams and so Brandon much. Clark. And Brandon, Brandon Clark. Clark too. And Luke Kennard in the last Luke game because his yeah. own off numbers looked like he was Steph Curry in the series. So, <laughs> I mean, um, if you watch the Lakers, they really just packed the paint. I mean, they it was hard for Ja to get anything, you know, in the, uh, in the paint with Anthony Davis lurking. And he also got, you know, Jared Vanderbilt on him. So that's why Dylan Brooks was so cool. They needed Dylan Brooks to hit shots. Mm-hmm. You know, this might have been a whole different this series if, been, and that's if Dylan really Brooks shot like 40% or like, it's like 35 pl- uh, plus from three. Yeah. I mean, if he shot like, like you said, 40% from three, they probably win. They probably win. Yeah, they yeah. Probably and win. he's probably doing press conferences if he's shooting yeah, yeah. 35%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a part of, for me, I think, like you said, the maturity aspect of not even just Ja, but um, I know he had the biggest situation, but. The Dylan Brooks antics and then to backpedal. Um, it, it's to not do media also. That's that yeah. is just optically like it's it's hard for you to, you know, do everything that you did <laughs> when you're winning or you feel like you're in a position yep. of strength and yep. then when it hits the fan you you know run away. It's, it's, it's yeah. It's just tough. And I mean, it has to lose respect in the locker room. You know what I mean? If we just being honest, because if if any of if I did that here and put that pressure on my three teammates. Or even and even our producer Anwar to to go through the the battle of me talking crazy and then <laughs> we fall short and I'm backpedaling and I'm the one that's not trying to show my face and now Ja has to speak for me Coach Jenkins has to speak for me Jaron Jackson Desmond Bain um, I don't think Dylan Brooks is back I don't want to see him back <laughs> um, and I'm 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 honestly a little disappointed in the Grizzlies because I think that certain times. They had value in some of the guys that they have on that roster because I think they draft well, especially in the late parts of the draft with the picks in the 20s and things like that. And I think a lot of times they've had avenues to use some of those youthful players to go and make a big move. And I feel like because they waited a little bit, like I don't think Zaire Williams has the same value. I was thinking, I was thinking about guys. him like yeah. last year. He was getting a lot of you. Yeah. Solid. 
Yeah, he you know, started he, most of the season. He got hurt a little bit this year as well. But you know what I will say about Dylan Brooks? This year, there were teams that called Memphis about Dylan Brooks. Milwaukee, um, you know, there have been teams that have interest Defensive, in Dylan Brooks. N- I mean, and you look at him as that niche type of guy, defensively, yes. uh, yeah, three and D type Above of guy. All. So I, I do think. Listen, I, I don't want to hate on Dylan Brooks too much. I think there's gonna be some level of interest there from teams from mm-hmm. other and uh, the teams that are interest were contenders. Obviously, Milwaukee was a contender. So um, we'll, we'll see what the market bears for uh, for Dylan Brooks. But yeah, I mean, I think the team overall, like they they have to lock in. Yeah, that's sure. why like throughout the year, even when they wore the two seed, I was a guy that's saying I don't really look at them as like a true two seed they just seem like there was like a piece missing i think it's just like that extra killer next to job yes I feel like desmond bain is nice he's good but he's not like the prototypical like go-to guy of giant got it going if giant really got it going and when he's on the court that team kind of looks a little iffy but when he's off i think it seems like everybody kind of know they roll and they kind of like everybody fits in perfectly but when he's there it's kind of like if he ain't got it going everybody else kind of struggle to get their stuff off so it's like I think they really need that go-to bucket that's like a wing that can also do a little bit of other things. I Mikhail would have been perfect if, yeah. if yeah. Brooklyn was But also, was my thing, I'm scared with Mikhail. Is he going to be Brooklyn Mikhail along the next uh, another ball dominant guy, or is he yeah. going to go back to Phoenix? No, once he once 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 a guy like Mikhail taps into it, you don't go back. I, I hope think so. when the first the first form of him was all we knew and all he knew was the Suns' role that he was given. Lindy. Once yeah, once you tap into something else, especially as a pro, and you see for yourself. I can average 26 points in a playoff setting as a guy. You know, I, it's very hard to go back from that. Yeah. It's, it's very hard. I think once once a guy like Mikhail sees that he can do that and become it, um, I don't think you just lose it and based off going to a different team. I do think they need that type of guy, though. Yeah, for sure. Um, in a fantasy world, you look at, like, Jalen Brown will go over there and they – but I mean, Jalen Brown goes anywhere. He's, yeah, he's yeah. one of those. You know what I mean? So one of the hottest names for every sure. Team wants. But they definitely need somebody who can be almost on par with Josh ja, some yeah. nights. And mm-hmm. I, I, I agree with you. I like Desmond Bain. Uh, I don't want to take anything away from him, but I don't think he's that guy. No. Yeah, and this, and this and is fine. basically just year two of his every breakout, and I, yeah. and, and he's I got like better every year. Based that. on how he plays, though, his play style, it doesn't make me feel confident in mm-hmm. him being that guy. He's a smaller guy. He relies heavy on the three-point shot. I think they kind of need a legitimate shot creator at all three levels. Ja Mm -hmm. is more attacking downhill. Desmond Bain is getting the three-point shots off. He can hit a mid-range shot and finish a little bit, but I don't classify him as a legitimate three-level scorer, at least not yet. So if they had somebody who was a 6'7", 6'8", with a little bit of a a bag, I think that would would be nice. Uh, I I mean, like, and I agree with you. I don't think Desmond Bain is – at that type of level, I think more part of the adjustments I was talking about with the Lakers is they were just like any type of screen, they was hard hedging it. They was making they was trapping them a little bit, making them pick up his dribble. And it's just like you said, that's like kinda like the first time he's really seen that in a play especially in a playoff setting. But one thing about Dylan uh Desmond Bain is I feel like he's just stepped like he's added to his game every year. You know, I felt like he was more of a spot, you know, more mm-hmm. spot up shooter. Added more, more to his handle. Added more to his playmaking. Added more to his fin- every year. He's gotten better. I feel like this is something he looks back at, and he's like, you know what? I know what I need to work on to be better next season. And that's, I don't know. It's just the type of guy he is, and that's why I also had respect for him when they had that loss. And um, he was the only dude, uh, I, you know, out of the top names, the only dude that went up to the press conference. Or we're or, overthinking this, mm-hmm. and Jaron Jackson plays how he did down the stretch and do thir- certain spor- uh, spurts in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. He was he was a go-to guy. Yeah, yeah, he, was. For certain certain he was putting up big numbers. Yeah. For sure. I'm well, disappointed. I like D-Bain. I like D-Bain. That in that series against the Lakers, we saw in game one, Jaron was going at LeBron heavy, and he ended up with 32-ish mm-hmm. points. We didn't see that again for the no, rest of the not. series. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever LeBron was guarding whoever, they didn't try to attack because LeBron is trying to use that side of the ball as a time to rest and stuff. Um, and and Jaron kind of took advantage of that literally in game one, and we never saw it again. So I think that, you know, that could have helped them win the series, you know. How that phone is when somebody like Kyrie is courtside at a playoff game with a team he's been linked to. That phone, your phone ringing off a lot when something like that happens. People, yeah, I mean, I see it; <laughs> it, it gets sent to me. <clears throat> but um, Lakers had their chance to go get Kyrie Irving. You know, they they didn't put in the offer I think that Brooklyn wanted, and Brooklyn moved on to the Dallas offer. And now Kyrie's going to go into free agency, and I'm sure you know, there's going to be a lot more chatter <laughs> about yeah. the Lakers. But I mean, you get, you got to say this: the Lakers restocked their team at the deadline. Your your team, they restocked. They got D'Angelo Russell, uh, Malik Beasley, Jared Vanderbilt. Um, I mean. I think the trade kind of paid off, right? No, so, for sure, for sure. We were a totally different team. 
I, I think at the time team. the Lakers were probably getting panned. Um, but you know when when he got traded to Dallas, I think when you look at the move that they made, it reminded me more of that 2020 championship bubble team where it's like you have two guys, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and then you have just a supporting cast of just good to really good role players. Mm-hmm. Um, like Austin Reeves, D'Angelo Russell, any given night or your third best player on any given night on that year's teams, Kyle Kuzma or Dwight Howard, mm-hmm. whoever could be your third best player. So they kind of went back to the old formula versus trying to get another all-star mm-hmm. in Russell Westbrook. But, um, you know, free agency is an interesting time. You saw Damian Lillard sit courtside yep. at, yep. the, uh, at the at the Nets game. By the way, he, that's, that's your guy. He can yeah, identify Damian Lillard from his back. Oh, my God. Just the tattoos <laughs> on his back. That that's that's Damian Lillard. You want to be a net? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think, I think, you know, we'll see who else pops up at some of these games that, you know, it could be a free agent or you know, rumor trade guy. I love seeing players sit courtside at games. I don't really look into it too much. I think they're just players that enjoy watching basketball, and they get to just – they have the privilege to sit mm-hmm. courtside. I think you're saying that because your boy Dame was sitting somewhere else. Yes, I <laughs> no. agree. I pay attention I, to it all. I Portland mean, fan right here? Yes. yes. Portland, got Port- you. Got he's you. Portland. He's the Bulls, San Antonio Spurs. Used to be the Jazz. Used to be a Jazz. He just had why a King's hoodie on. He just so had much. a King's hoodie on. Like he did have a King's hoodie. He said he asked why you move around so much. Oh, more so just players. I, I become a fan of players, but Chicago is always That's Chicago is always my love. Like I'm always yeah. love Chicago regardless. I, I think about that. I was thinking about that recently. How I wish that I was more of a player guy yeah, instead of a team about guy. That. He was talking about that in no Discord. Uh, yeah. Just just because it's easier. Because now when you're a fan of a team, you're trusting the management. And the owners to do the right thing. And I, I and fell a out lot of, love of times, with that. yeah. With Garpex, they made it me kind of like. Garpex kind of made me like not really fall in love with. After the LeBron stuff, where they didn't go after LeBron just because they didn't want to pay Chris Bosh, that sh- that was like, damn. Okay, you missed out on having a big three, and but instead they go to Miami. Mm. That's when I was like, damn, I can't. Really I think up. with Garpex specifically, where um did it for me w- was. The Derrick Rose trade, it felt overdue, but we also just got back Robin Lopez. You know, that was the oh. Derrick Rose trade. <laughs> and then we do the Jimmy Butler trade. And now we see, na- like, seven years later, Jimmy Butler's still one of the oh, best Larry players. Larry Markin. But we got Larry Markin, and then we shifted him away for a second-round pick in Derrick Jones Jr. And then he turned to the most improved player. So um, that was a different regime, though. That wasn't Gar Pax with the Larry Markin and stuff. But yeah. uh, I was more thinking, like, on the baseball tip, that we trust the White Sox to do stuff. And we diehard White Sox fans, That's and they won't an do anything. Question. Chicago guy, I read you're a big Bulls fan. Well, I grew up a Bulls fan. Um, oh, so so it's so probably the Kirk Heinrich, Ben Gordon team. Oh yeah, yep. Tyson mid two thousand, super scrappy. One year they started zero and nine. Like that that year was really the first year where my fandom started mm-hmm. for basketball for the NBA. I played basketball, but then yeah, for sure you grew up a Bulls fan. You grew up tracking that team, and and, and obviously the Derrick Rose teams. Th- that was a blast to watch. I was in high school. For his MVP, you know, I think I was a sophomore in high school the year he won MVP. Um, but like once I started getting down this path and like in 2010, 2011, and 11, 12, you like lose your fandom. You kind of become a fan of, you know, it's, it's tough to say in a like self, selfish way. You don't become a fan of yourself, but you become a fan of the stories that okay. you're either telling or you're working okay. on. So in a lot of ways, it's very, very self centered and, mm-hmm. and you're thinking very much like, not me, but like, all right, this is what I'm working on, or like this player I'm gonna interview, or this is, you know, kind of like you guys. You guys are working on interviewing whoever. Um, you know, you you put your focus on that, and so that kind of distracts you away from like having an actual fandom. So, you know, I obviously have friends that are Bulls fans. Mm-hmm. I had I kind of let go, and it's it's weird because it kind of just happened naturally because I just became obsessed with the stories with the mm-hmm. people you know that I that I, that I have relationships with and things like that. When you speak on stories, another thing that I heard you <laughs> speak on before was being in the heat of experiences. What yeah. does that necessarily mean when you say that? I don't. Why like, is that important to you? I think it's important because, like, actually going out and experiencing what what it is you want to do, whether it's you know, for me, it was covering games, interviewing players, uh, breaking stories, um, going and covering you know, wh- whether it's summer league, the finals, like going out and actually being a part of that versus being in the classroom, you know, at school. So mm-hmm. I graduated Loyola Chicago. Shout out Loyola Chicago. Shout out the Ramblers. Shout out Sister Jean. Sister Jean. <laughs> I graduated in 2017. The year after I graduate, they, they go, they to, the went final, on a run. They go yeah. to the Final Four, which was a blast. I was there. It was fun to be a part of. Um, Dante Ingram, we actually, you know, shout out Dante Ingram. Uh, we had small group communication class. He was in the class. Super, super dope guy. <laughs> Everyone on that team, really good people. But, like, I didn't get any 
enjoyment or anything fulfilling when I was actually in the classroom. Um, obviously, I think it all helped me in the long run, and I was able to absorb a lot of things that now I think about. But what really helped me was actually going and traveling to Milwaukee and mm -hmm. traveling to Indianapolis to go cover games or going to Summer League, um, going to the NBA Finals. My first NBA Finals was 2013. Uh, I was 19 we years still old. Waiting. Whoa! Yeah. Do, do you, you guys got to go. I know. I, I, Hopefully, I, this I, is the I year. think this year. Th yeah. this, this year, we'll make it happen. We, you we make, you make, make it a happen. lot of sense. So, um, we just did. We were at the media day, and that was our first time experiencing that. And obviously, we talked about media day for you know for X amount of years. But to actually be there and to you know see these players doing their interviews, like one of my favorite parts is not even like them really answering a question, but uh, Luca was you know just talking. And he answered questions like three different languages. And it's just like to be there in moment, it's just like, wow. You know, it's just like difference between just like watch him on a court or, you know, watch him in a video. Yeah. Getting like to actually build those relationships with, mm -hmm. I mean, it could even be a player. It could be, you know, industry people like those are to me like more meaningful right. and like being a part of that. And when I was starting out when I was you know, 17 years old, 16 years old, I was literally cold calling people, mm -hmm. you know, any email phone number, anything I could find online, whether it was you know team, could be an agent, could be whoever. Whatever really I could find on Google.com, I was just mm -hmm. hunting down. And uh, some people responded, some didn't. Kind of, you have to get lucky mm -hmm. along the way. And uh, But I think for me, just going back to your question, like actually going out and experiencing all that, like that changed everything for me and, and uh, definitely helped me in, in many more ways than like being in the classroom could have. What would you say is the key to... Like, if people do want to get into, like, your field where they're, like, breaking news and doing stuff like that, how do you even get into that, like, field to where you're breaking big news? Well, when I when I first started, I didn't think I was going to be in that because when I first started, I was writing a lot. So my passion was writing. My passion was playing basketball. So I got cut playing basketball. And once <laughs> I got cut, I was like, all right, I'm not going to be like MJ. I got cut sophomore year of high school. Like, I'm not going to be. Similar to Same. <laughs> I'm not well, going to be MJ. Miles Varsity. Miles Varsity. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be MJ and, right. uh, yeah. and, and, and make it to the league, unfortunately. But I love I loved basketball. I loved writing. And so kind of combined both passions. And uh, I just started doing, like, analysis stories and just writing, writing, and writing. I was writing 3,000, 4,000 words a day. Jeez. You know, junior of high school, sophomore of high school, senior of high school. I don't. I don't think I write that much. Anymore, <laughs> you know? Fortunately or unfortunately, I don't right. have to write that much anymore. But I think that allowed me to find my voice. So the mm -hmm. biggest advice I would give to anyone, you know, if you're trying to get into not only breaking news or whatever, like media in general, is find your voice. You know, you guys find your voice through, you know, being on camera and talking and podcasting and doing all that. Like I wasn't even thinking about being on camera right. or doing <laughs> any of that when I started out. I was just a straight writer. I was doing analysis stories, and then from there, you make contacts, you break a story, you break a 10-day, you break a, a minimum contract, and it's just like <laughs> small wins. You yeah. know, you just build small wins, build small goals, accomplish them, make more goals, and you just you just keep going. And um, I still don't think it's it's ended. You know, I, I still feel like, I mean, you guys look hungry. Like, I feel Definitely. like I'm the same way. I, I mm -hmm. still don't feel like I've accomplished anything. So. Right. A lot, a lot more to do. Yeah, when you're young, I still feel like you still had an urge to, like, I could still accomplish more, and there's still more things I want to Like, we still haven't gone to NBA Finals, like you said. There's still more things we want to get to and do as a group. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about the location part. Because in sports media, it feels like, unless you're covering a team in the market, it's like, move to New York or move to L.A. to cover sports. And here you are is basically one of the few people that don't, cover bulls exclusively living in chicago and i wanted to know is that is that by design is it like that you wanted to stay close to home or it's just a perfect combination with stadium i definitely want to stay close to home I mean, my whole family's out here super close with my mom she's out here so i mean chicago's still a really big city for sure now we, we, we're not gonna we're not gonna dog on our yeah. city like yeah for <laughs> sure new york la like everyone wants to make you know a big deal out of being in those cities and mm. i spend you know you guys have traveled to both cities too like mm. I like New York. I like LA, but I feel like Chicago is the perfect home. middle yeah. ground. Yeah. Yes, it is. Talk New about it. <laughs> New York is the hustle and bustle. It's yep. always like a million miles a second. And I like that because I go one week during the draft and I'm already mentally, emotionally, physically a million miles per second. So <laughs> being a part of that environment, I feel right at home. Right. But then in normal times, I don't know if I would like that. And then in LA, super laid back. So laid yes. back. Super mm -hmm. laid back. Too laid back. And uh, again, I could spend a week there, but. Then you you come home to your roots, mm -hmm. blue collar city, and I think Chicago is like a perfect balance of both. Yeah. Um, and for me, what what really drew me to Chicago, which is better to me than than the other places, is 
having three NBA markets, right? The mm-hmm. Bulls, the Bucks, and the Pacers. All driving distance, all very close. All very close to each other. And so I was covering games in Milwaukee and Indianapolis when I was, you know, in high school and early in college and, like, you know, missing out on parties, missing out on, on uh, you know, really trying to get good grades. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I was yeah. just, you know, C's get degrees. Like, that was really my philosophy. So um, I read about that. You was taking a Camry. Yeah, Name my mom. <laughs> my mom's. Uh, I I even got you know I don't know if I, I think I might have told this story, but not in depth. I got like three speeding tickets in a month. Four speeding That's tickets crazy. in a month. I got my license suspended. So <laughs> Damn. Yeah, 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 because you know I, I guess you you don't want to be caught speeding. Uh, you know that many times. Yeah. You know when I was on those drives from like Indianapolis back to Chicago, and I have a final the next day. I'm like rushing to get home so I get like at least three hours of sleep before a final yeah. the next day, and I'm going. You know, probably 85 on a 60. <laughs> <laughs> so the three hours of sleeping is something that's been going on since high school. Like, I, I heard you say that you still only get, like, three, four hours of sleep still. Yeah, I mean, you know, I try to get more than that sometimes. But, yeah. um, you know, especially during the weekday. I mean, it's mm-hmm. like you're you're so, like, focused and ready to get to get, get, get to the next day, to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah, so yeah. I'm kind of so just waiting. So how demanding is it, you know, technically? I mean, how much free time do you have in your hands? Um, I mean... I think you you kind of figure it out as the day goes on. You know, right. you kind of pick and choose your spots, pick and choose which weekends, which days out of the weekends you can, you know, take family time. You know, that's really how I spend my time. Is like a lot of time with my mm-hmm. family, a lot of time, you know. What do you like to do like in that time? I mean, go out to eat. I okay. mean, Top Golf is always a good oh, vibe. Top Golf. I, okay. I, I don't know big why golf. I knew you were gonna say. Yeah, I knew you were gonna say Top Golf because it's like it, it's a little bit of an activity. Yeah. yeah. Then you also get some time to like spend with people. Right. It's like the best middle ground. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I'm not gonna take Top Golf ambassador. I still have. Yeah, <laughs> I still <laughs> haven't. You got the hookups there or what? No, I don't. Oh, have, I'm I was not about to no, say. He might as well. <laughs> for every time we have a friend who is in the Marines. Yeah. And when he comes on, he always want to hang out. Anytime it's time to do anything <laughs> like a, that, it's a great hangout. He says, "Top Golf, Top Golf. We're gonna go to Top Golf. Y'all wanna go to Top Golf? Let's go to Top Golf." It's Top like, like an outdoor like, event that you don't need to plan for. Like, oh, it's cold, so let me get a jacket. Yeah. Like it's. I like it. And I don't know why. I feel it's fun teeing off balls. Like, it's, it's fun doing that to me. I don't mm-hmm. know why. Take your turns. And everyone can do it. My mom can do it. My yeah. sister can yeah, do it. Yeah. It doesn't It's it like doesn't a fun little competitive game, too. It's nice. You been to Push Shack? I don't think I have. Got to go Relatively to Push Shack. Local. Push Shack, I like. Yeah. I'll check it out. I I've like. been to Big, Big Little Putt. Oh, I haven't mm-hmm. heard of that one. I haven't heard of that. Push Shack is like, uh, you go. it's indoor. You go around, and you're. it's like mini golf, but it has trivia. But yeah. it also has drinks. It's called it has Big food. Mini Putt, actually. Big, Big Mini Putt. Putt. Big Mini yeah. Putt. Might have checked that on out. Milwaukee Ave. Yeah. Good yeah. spot. Good spot. Go on the out. holidays. You know, <laughs> <laughs> nice little vibe. Nice little vibe. Um, but yeah, I mean, just I mean, work out. You know, I still love playing basketball. It's just hard for me mm-hmm. yeah. to uh, you know mentally focus on the game. You'll be our because, fifth. Because <laughs> I, I'll, pl- I'll definitely we, we'll get runs going. We gotta do runs at like nine, ten p.m. We're hopefully that's the best it's, time. It's, it's a little bit of downtown yeah. in in the schedule. But it's hard for me, like mentally focused, because I want to focus on the game, but like, right. half my mind is on my phone. So yeah, it's, <laughs> not, yeah, it's sure. not healthy. It's not a healthy playing style. <laughs> I'm loving some of these conversations that we're having because uh, the important thing for me, why you're here, um, is the fact that we have a lot of young adults who watch us and they aspire to get in this industry some way, fashion, or form, whether. It's being in a podcast, a YouTuber, doing what you're doing, being a reporter, writing columns for somebody. And uh, I think you're hitting on a lot of good topics. One of the things I wanted to ask was the process of building a source. Because I would imagine, like, hypothetically speaking, I could text you and I could give you information about Kenny. How do you confirm me as a source to be reliable enough and comfortable enough to take my information that I'm giving you and and put it out, if that makes sense? Because I would imagine you have a lot of people trying to tell you things. Oh, How do you oh weave out the <laughs> bullshit? I mean, now, I mean, that's really what the job is now, is weeding out the BS. That's literally what my, I feel like that's what my job has okay. become. Um, because there's so much stuff, especially now when you go on, on social media, mm-hmm. a lot, uh, there's a lot of stuff that floats out there. So, um, usually before it floats out there, it's making its way to me and I'm supposed to decipher what's real, what's mm-hmm. not real. Um, but I think the biggest thing is like what you just said is like 
figuring out who's BSing you versus who's being honest with you versus if there is an agenda to it and, and there's truth to it, how do we weed through that and get to the tr- as much to the truth as possible? Because, yes, my job is to be first, but also my job more than anything is to be 100% accurate. Mm-hmm. And even when I'm 98% right on a story and there's that you know 2% that's a little off, I hate, I can't even sleep. Like I, I, I like lose my mind, you know? It's like, yeah. it's, what's the most torture story you've received where you're just like, damn, I c- I'm so glad I ain't put this out? <laughs> How you know he ain't put it out? Oh, I'm just, I was gonna say, what's the, what's <laughs> the most BS one you put out? I'm trying to, I'm trying to, that you can think of off top. Now I'm gonna have this man lose his sources. Y'all better no, no, I mean, I mean, I mean, a lot of it is just like technical stuff, right? If a guy signs a, you know, four year deal, but, you know, you, you, uh, you know, you might, you might, you know, but the team might not be allowed to sign to a four-year deal. They can only do three-year mm-hmm. deals, mm-hmm. so they, you know, you kind of got it right, but then you still kind of, like the other day. So the NFL draft. So I, I saw you tweet so, about. It. So, so, first pick Bryce Young, second pick C.J. Stroud, third pick Will Anderson Jr. And uh, he, all three picks are right, but then the third pick, it got traded from the Cardinals to the Texans. Yeah. So when I put it out, all right, Cardinals selecting him. Now, what I can't account for, unfortunately, as, as a as a quasi NFL insider, is the trade. Yeah, I'm gonna leave that to the Ian yeah. Rappaport to the world. <laughs> right. And so when I broke the pick, and then the trade came out, yeah, people saying, "Oh, you know, it's wrong or whatever." And I'm like, I mean, the pick is right. <laughs> the but you know what? Is, yeah. Now yeah. I'm gonna, you know, next year when I, you know, I'm a, I'm I'm sharpened now. You know, I'm a sharp <laughs> I'm sharpened the mm. iron on this one. I appreciate what you do, and I love it. But I'm gonna be honest with you while you're here. I think you're a year older than me. You're 29. 29 I'm yep. 28. So we come from the same era. The era of watching the NBA draft and having the pick be an element of surprise, you have taken that from me. That's the only time we turn <laughs> the noties off. You that have one day. Just that, that one from day. Me to watch it and be like, yo, oh, what pick we get in? And it's like, you tell me. You can watch for the suspense. You can watch for the suspense and also see if I'm accurate. But I, because I w- there also have been years. Oh, here's a good one. Keldon Johnson. The Cavs had narrowed in on selecting him. And I remember I put out <laughs> Cavaliers. <laughs> you said the narrowed it in. You got you to make sure you frame it right. <laughs> Cavaliers plan to select Keldon Johnson. I think it was the 29th overall pick. And literally with 30 seconds, you know, there's a timer. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, think, I think with like 450 I put out. All right, they're going Keldon Johnson. And then with like 30 seconds, they switched. It went from Keldon Johnson to DJ Windler. Oh wow! And, uh, <laughs> wow, they made a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> you said it, not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dylan um, Windler had a little s- a sniper on. Oh, he just Dylan Windler, my bad. Just can't stay healthy. Yeah, um, Dylan Windler. He's a Twitch streamer too. Is Plays he? Fortnite. Oh, that's what's up. Yep. So, you know, that was kind of you know it was kind of off. So you you know you can follow me and follow the draft at the same time. It could be a fun experience to see how wrong I am, how right I am. Ninety percent, ninety eight percent of the time, like you said previously, you you are right. Was there? Um, I have to still watch because there's the trade element. That wasn't I'm there to a hiccup this year in the draft with the Knicks? Yes, because we traded the pick. Yeah, they, and they, it was, they was they a very lot of confusion. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember yeah. that one. So that one was an interesting one because Jalen Duran drafted by the Knicks, and then they traded him. So I think it came out that the Pistons are drafting Jalen Duran. Everyone's like, "How the how the Pistons drafted? <laughs> right, right, right. They must have traded for that." Yeah, so I think it was number thirteen. Mm-hmm. Was it number thirteen? Or I number think so. Some in that yeah, round. Yeah, like a that. lottery yeah. pick. And everyone's like, or maybe it was number nine. Everyone's like, "How do they? How, how do the Pistons do that?" And then like I'm scrambling trying to figure it out. <laughs> and I think I put out, "Oh, they're trading Jalen Duran and Kemba Walker to the Pistons." Uh, I think they got back, you know, whatever they got back, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, I mean, there's always confusion. That's why right. it's funny. The NFL draft, you know, I get I get caught in that one. It's like this happens in the NBA too. But the only other thing that doesn't happen in the NFL that I found out is when a guy gets drafted, like when the, when Will Anderson Jr. goes on stage on the podium, he gets his Texans hat. Oh, and that's, his, that's and good. his jersey. Oh. And the NBA doesn't do that, right? In the NBA, no, that always happens. Yeah. threw me off too. Larry Markin has a Minnesota Timberwolves picture instead of a Bulls picture, even though we knew the trade happened. Mikael Bridges. Mikael Bridges. Got, see, so w- the Will Anderson situation is exactly what happened with Mikael Bridges. He gets drafted by Philly, and then I remember I think he's going to the podium, and I put out he got traded to the Suns. So he's doing his post draft presser with a Sixers hat <laughs> on, yeah. while everyone's asking him about his trade to the Suns. Yeah. So I feel like you just gotta, gotta like fix that. As soon as you're done, you just gotta throw that hat away, it. right? So I think you gotta watch with the love of just seeing how right 
are wrong. <laughs> I, I, can, I might be. May, maybe that'll provide you the suspense you need. Yeah, true. <laughs> true enough. Um, one of the last things I want to ask you is same thing with the sword. When you're new and you, because now you're solidified, so everybody's trying to come to you with some type of information. But when you were newer and getting involved, how did you create a source? How did you go out and build a contact with uh, a rich climate who was, you know, representing Kevin Durant and whatnot, because those guys are hard to get to. So what were you doing to get there? I think initially for sure it was like cold call, cold text to as many contacts as I can find. <laughs> and it wasn't easy. Um, but then the biggest thing was like going to events, right? Like su- going to summer league, going to games, like, like what we talked about earlier, like actually going out in the, in the bat quote unquote battlefield, actually going out and experiencing it, putting yourself through the wire, through the fire, like actually going through it. Um, that to me changed changed everything. Uh, so when I went to my first summer league in 2013, that was like an eye opening experience. I was deer in the headlights, didn't know anyone, and I think you know that was the first lesson for me is like what makes you uncomfortable, like you got to make that comfortable, and you need to make that. And then you know as many uncomfortable positions as you can put yourself in. It sounds tough, yeah, but that's where you really find about yourself, find out about yourself. You you put yourself through those experiences. So that's probably the biggest thing for me is like. The relationships probably came from events. I, you know, you guys saw me at Adidas at the Adidas party. I saw you guys like those events like that. You know, and and making the rounds. How I think that's the next step for us because sure. we are in a lot of these spaces. We're at summer league every year. We're at the Adidas event. Um, I think we have too many moments. We're like, oh, there goes so and so, and we never. Yeah, we don't talk. To take them. the step to Just talk don't to step them. On yeah. talk. Like, well, Anwar, did we did we speak to Shams when we seen him? The, these three gentlemen yeah. decided yeah. to take the night off. When we I, went yeah, to I was I was not at the party, <laughs> but and I made it a mission. Like, oh, I'm gonna go network. I did not network at I all. I waited for a terrible <laughs> hotel stay. <laughs> oh. Yeah, he told the Salt Lake over Adidas. Yeah, yeah. at a new yeah. restaurant, a restaurant that opened guy, the day before. You were there. Damian Lillard was there. Yeah. Damian was, Dam- Dam- was there for a while. Yeah, too. he was. He was there for a while. He sh- I think he shut it down then. He was there to like two a.m. Yeah, but he was not on like. Party stuff. No, he yeah. was literally chilling. I see. Yeah, he was, co- was cooler. What's what it? So when you talk about uncomfortable situations, is that you approaching people? And when you do approach these people, do you go in there pretending that you know them, that you don't know? I mean, I, there's some familiarity I have to you have to express. But are you in there like, yo, what up, uh, D. <laughs> Bobby, Bobby Webster? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think. All I can think about now is like when I first started, how I was before, right? And it was a lot of just introductions, you know, like introducing myself because no one knew who I was. Mm-hmm. I had no entry point to the NBA. I had no relationships, no connections. So they don't know me as much as I know them by their name, but I really don't know, know them, right? Mm-hmm. So it was like, how can we, you know, build that relationship and really not approach that conversation with, hey, I need this or, um, you know, I want this from you. It's let's build an organic relationship and see if anything can come come of it in a way of, Know, building a professional, um, you know, back and forth. So I think that for me was was the biggest thing, and um, definitely a lot of deer in the headlight moments, mm-hmm. though, like a lot of like uncomfortable moments because it's it's hard to just go up to people is, yeah. that don't know you, that you really don't know them or their story. Um, so that was definitely you know what was uncomfortable, and then also like my first interviews, uh, first time I interviewed, you know. A player was actually Dwayne Wade, August 2012. Oh, that's, wow, a, that's good a big start. That's a yeah. big interview. <laughs> yeah, buzz cut. Yeah, I was, I was, you know, I was trembling. You know, butterflies in your stomach. You're trembling. Definitely. You don't, know, you don't know if you're asking the right question. Um, and I think a lot of what helped me early, and I think for young people, for sure, finding your voice with whatever you do, whether you know you're podcasting, you're writing. But another thing, you have to move. I think with a level of naivety, with a level of like, you really don't know. Mm-hmm. You don't know what you don't know, but you also don't want to move in a way where you know the answers. So, like, I interviewed Dwayne Wade um, in August 2012, and then I pull up on him. I think they played the Bucks in November, mm-hmm. and he had his feet in the ice bucket. <laughs> <laughs> this is Miami Heat, Dwayne Wade. Miami Heat, yeah. Dwayne Wade. And uh, he was he didn't have a shirt on. He just had a towel on, <laughs> his feet in the ice bucket. And I didn't know protocols. I didn't know, oh, you got to wait for a guy to shower, mm-hmm. and then and then you, you know, want to approach for an interview. So I just went up to him, and uh, – you know, and I think he kind of looked at me weird. The PR guy came over and was like, yo, like, and I think, you know, at the time, D-Wade was like, no, it's all good. Dwayne was like, it's all good. And he gave me the interview. And then, like, maybe five weeks later, I'm like, I learned. I'm like, oh, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> I was <laughs> up. Damn. 
And so I actually saw, I actually saw Dwayne and Austin, and we laugh about that now. It's a funny moment now because I I didn't know, and like mm-hmm. there's still things now where I, again, I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing. I got the interview, mm-hmm. you know, I got the quotes that I needed to get. So technically, I I won that day, but uh, I think no, sometimes not knowing, you know, can be can be your best teacher. Yeah, I think is when you new in the media like we were, there's a learning curve to being around people that you're not used to being around. I think you got to learn how to separate being a fan. Versus like being media and like business. I, I agree. And it was a learning curve for me for sure to learn to be in that space. The toughest thing for me is the fact that number one, these people, these guys, women, whatever, they're famous, they're busy, and all eyes are on them. So it's like for me, I can at- I can detach myself from being a fan because after a certain amount of time and years, you you know, you're here for work and it's a yep. business and professionalism. Mm-hmm. But it's like you don't when when there's people in rooms that everybody is trying to get something out of, it's hard to approach because in their mind, this you're just another person that wants something from them, and so sometimes like ah, I ain't gonna say nothing because I I would I would imagine like at the Adidas thing, Dane me and Dane was getting drinks at the same time and I'm like I ain't gonna, I'm not even gonna say anything to him because everybody in his room has probably said something or wants something too. from him. So it's kind of hard to gauge of like when to, you know what I mean? Because sometimes you don't want anything. You just want to literally introduce yourself, but they have to have a, a guard up because shit, to a lesser degree, we deal with the same thing. Uh, all day my DMs are gone, and it's mostly people wanting something from me. It's a whole different level from Dame. I'm not comparing myself to an NBA <laughs> player, but it's just like you have to, you same know. Same concept, though. Same, same concept. concept. Yeah. So a lot of times that my hardest part is trying to figure out when to go in and how to approach it to where they don't think you're just another number of a person trying to get something from them. Right. Because a lot of the time it's genuine. For me, I grew up on a lot of these guys. I'm a basketball fanatic. You know what I mean? Like when I was reading some parts of your story about you being on Real GM and Hoops Hype and refreshing the That feed, was my dream. I, I feel like I made it. Yeah. I made it. Like when I was writing for Real GM, I'm like, I made it. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. That was. This is my dream. P- people from our era, like you, that that's real basketball love of just being on there and refreshing and trying to get any type of information or any action to f- to fulfill you. And so when you get to this level to be in rooms with some of these people, um, even if they're not playing anymore, like when we had Jamal Crawford, it's like I had to tell he's Jamal. A, he's a legend. Man, yeah, he's a great dude. For real. He's a legend and a great dude. And it's like I, I, I grew up on you. So sometimes it's just you want to go and let a person know the admiration because Jamal Crawford might not be a Hall of Famer, but for us – He's a Hall of Fame in the hearts of us because mm-hmm. we grew up on him, and a lot of times it's just hard to 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 balance that. And again, like Derek said, you don't want to come off as a fan, but a lot of people you just want to simply give their flowers to because they have an impact on your life more than they'll ever know. It's the same thing when we go do a show and people stand there to interact with us. We have more of an impact on their life mm-hmm. than we may know. You know, the yeah, first time that's people were asking you for autographs, you're like, oh, what the hell? That's, like, why, you're impacting <laughs> that's why I think Shams was on point when he was like, you got to have in that that mindset, like, you don't know, though. Because mm-hmm. from right there, it just seemed like, oh, I'm already assuming that, like, I damn near lost the battle already. You might make an impression. You might never forget. Yeah. So I think that's just like that. I don't know. But connections is so important. You know, I think that's something I personally still need to work on. Probably everybody, you know, still is working on that because it's just so important. I seen something that kind of, like, resonated with me, too. It's just like, connections that will take you further than just hard work and it's just like i can see it going combined with it it's true you know it's just like knowing these people and having these type of relationships they just get you access to things that you know somebody who doesn't can't yeah no that's right i think sometimes your proper connections could get you much further than like somebody who may be more qualified like if you know the top guy Mm -hmm. you can contact him with what other guy might have to fill out a whole job application, go to mm-hmm. interviews and all that. Mm-hmm. But you could just yeah. make a phone call and be like, hey, I just lost my job. You got something for me? <laughs> yeah. And they could be like, that's a real yeah, plug right there. Right, right, right. Yeah, and then you just push old dude who already got the, all the qualifications down the line, and now you got the job. So. I feel y'all. But in this industry, you got to work hard to get those connections. That's why yeah, I, so like, that's why I say It I feels like there's combine. not a lot of shortcuts. Yeah. True. Yeah, no. That's Which why is I said the best way to be? Yeah, no, I would rather yeah. grind for it. Mm-hmm. That's why I said it's kind of like that combined, um, that combined aspect to it, but it's just more so just like, oh, I know X, X, and X. It's just you already got to step there. You already got your foot in the door is what yeah. I'm kind of saying. Mm-hmm. My last question for Shams before we move on and talk about my Knicks and the predictions of the second round or whatever. Uh, what type of things did you take in consideration or did you value when you transitioned um, from 
your your last company of Yahoo and having to move on to the athletic and stadium, what things were you looking for of value um, when you make a transition from, you know, one place to another? Yeah, I mean, when you go from like an established company to two companies that at that point weren't, didn't have the name, the notoriety, you know, weren't really established in the media foothold. I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of rolling the dice a little bit, but the hunger that they had, like I know at that point when I left Yahoo in 2018, like I was hungry. Like I was determined. I was, I, st- I still feel like I am, but like I was, I wanted to be around people that had the same energy, the same vibe, the same hunger, the same desire. And the athletic and stadium had that. And, you know, to be able to write and keep writing, but then also to be able to do on camera. Cause I did a little bit of on camera at Yahoo. Mm-hmm. Uh, but stadium was like, we want you to go to the next level. We want you to be on air every day. We want you to get reps in. And I was all ears of that. Because when I first started, I had no visions of doing anything on camera. But then when I started at Yahoo, I'm like, I actually like this. Like, I like actually interacting with a player and like go having a back and forth and like interviewing them. Like, that was fun. So I want to just get into more more of that. So that's where that came into play. And it's been a great marriage. And this past year, I added FanDuel TV. And that one, you know, another experience where I'm gonna I'm on air a lot more. I mean, I have to do a show at 9 a.m. Central Time, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So it's Michelle Beadle, Chandler Parsons, Eddie Gonzalez, and like to wake up. I mean to be camera ready and to mm-hmm. be able to like, yeah, c- you know, concisely speak on some of these topics at nine in the morning. I mean, <laughs> I don't think I ever like, I I couldn't have prepared myself for that if I didn't go through this experience with FanDuel TV. And um, obviously, the big the biggest concern for me was like this the sports betting aspect of it because yeah. my job is very. Um, you know, I'm very direct. Like I'm about news. I'm about information. I'm about storytelling. And so you add the sports gambling aspect of it and the sports book part of it. And I think making sure the lines were never blurred, that it was very direct. Like we might, I might tweet about odds and I might, you know, it might be referenced on the shows, but I'm not going to be giving picks. I don't even know anything. Like, I don't, <laughs> I'm the last guy you want to ask about. Like, I don't know what the lines mean. I, 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 honestly. Yeah. Were you um, extremely nervous going into being on TV versus like just story writing and everything? Like, was it a hard transition for you? For sure, because that's where the butterflies were and that's where the uncomfortableness comes from, right? Like when I first, um, when I was doing my first interviews on camera, I was nervous as hell during those interviews. I could yeah. just remember my palms were sweaty for sure. Like butterflies in your stomach because you just, you, so you're uncomfortable. You don't yeah. know what, you, you yeah. really don't know what you're doing. And so learning from that, getting the reps from that. And so I started that in 2018. It's now 2023. So it's that five years, six years, you know, in the making. And I feel like I've gotten a lot better. I feel like there's a lot more work to do. Um, but, yeah, fan, you know, to be able to be a part of those companies, to be able to athletic, right, stadium, you know, do my 10 pole show. So we'll have a live draft show, a live free agency show, mm-hmm. live trade deadline show, and all these different shows that we do there. And then FanDuel TV and being a part of their big family. And so it's been dope experience. Definitely nothing that I pictured when I left Yahoo. Um, but, you know, I'm. I feel like I'm living out the dream already. Mm-hmm. I feel like I already accomplished my dream when I was at Real GM. So now it's yeah, kind of like you know the, the cherries on top. Dice keeps on the going, cake. keeps yeah. going. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, respect, respect. Um, Y'all want to transition into the Knicks? Or we want to talk about the Bucks first? Hey, we got to get to both. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's start with the Bucks because Sham said earlier if we got to the Bucks, so it seemed like you had some some things to talk about and discuss with the Bucs. What's, what's going on when you look at the landscape of the Bucks and how their season ended? Yeah, I mean, five-game loss. I mean, you lose one-eight matchup. I mean, that's not you, – you go into a very difficult summer right there. And I think even now there's a like I, I, two words that stand out in my mind from what I heard, what's going on in Milwaukee right now. It's a state of shock and it's a state of embarrassment. I don't yeah. think any of them, um, you know, players, coaches, front office, I don't, no one saw this season ending this way. Because they went into these playoffs as a prohibitive favorite. Mm-hmm. They were my Look favorite. Look at this team. Yeah. Yep. 2021, they won the chip. Um, last year, Chris Middleton gets hurt. So if he hadn't have gotten hurt, everyone there believes we would have won. Uh, we would have beat Boston. For sure. We would have went to the finals. And so now you lose. And now not only you have the free agencies of Chris. Chris Middleton's going to, you know, he has a player option. I assume, you know, he's going to enter free agency. Brooke Lopez, free agent. Um, there's not really ways for this team to get better. There's no cap space available. They're already in the tax. And then Mike Budenholzer, he's got two years, $16 million left on his deal. <laughs> and I, I think there is a sense of frustration within within that organization, within the locker room, uh, with the coaching. And a lot of that has to do with the lack of adjustments. Yeah, Jimmy Butler going off the way he did. Like that, mm-hmm. 
and not being able to find a, a defensive answer for him. Um, and Giannis, it's 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 very damning when your star player, franchise player, after the game says we didn't make adjustments, we did not adjust at all. I want to guard Jimmy. Um, in 2020, they said kind of the same stuff. I yeah, saw Milwaukee and Miami uh-huh. in the bubble. Miami beat Milwaukee very easily in the bubble too. This year really reminded me of that. This whole yes, series, yeah. sure. Milwaukee looked tight late in the game. Coaching, there was a lot of pressure on the coaching, and Mike Budenholzer's future was in question after 2020 as well. And then in even into the 2021 series, there was a lot of thought that if they had lost against the Nets in 2021, Mike Budenholzer would have been fired. For sure. Oh, for sure. Sure. Felt and like. then they win, and then we know the history. You know it's, the like the, it's like that he extension, like, yeah. Because, yeah. oh, you want a championship, here you go. You got yeah, right, you, rightfully so. Yeah. Yeah. Rightfully so. You want a chip, you know, first in, what, 50 years? Yeah. yeah. So I think now you look at it, there are a lot of expectations on this team, the lack of adjustments, the timeout situation that, that we know about, not getting a shot off in regulation when you had two uh, – in overtime, when you had two timeouts left. Um, pulling Brooke Lopez. Pulling Brooke Lopez uh, away from the basket on that dump-in play by yep. Jimmy. Um, there's a – Jake Crowder. You trade five second-round <laughs> picks to go get Jake Crowder. Jake Crowder played – Ten minutes, ten, a minutes a ten minutes a game. Ten minutes. DNP in one of the games. Too. Yeah, he just came out with comments saying yeah. that he didn't know his role. So there's a lot in Milwaukee right now, and 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 re- really like bigger picture than all that is Giannis, who's got I think two years left on his deal. I think one thing um, is that they're old. Brooke Lopez is a free agent. He's 35 years old. Chris Middleton's in his is in his 30s as well. Drew Holiday's in his 30s as well. This core has been together for a few seasons, and it, it feels like. They're just a bit a bit too old to keep bringing it back. Let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. So I don't really know where they go, and I think that's the most interesting part. Um, I've already seen stuff on Twitter about Giannis, especially when he talks about his frustration um, or um, about the lack of adjustments, like what can they do? Because last year, again, you got the excuse, Chris Middleton is out. This year, there is no excuse other than Giannis and play two games, but they lost the two games that Giannis did, did play. play. So it's yeah. like that's not even that big of an excuse. So we have to or they have to figure out, what are we doing free agency? Because mm-hmm. Brick Lopez feels irreplaceable. Yeah. Absolutely. And but I feel like yeah. you can't, and he's like the perfect center for Giannis. Like, he, no again, way. Again, he's a 35-year-old seven-footer yeah. who had back surgery a year ago. Mm-hmm. So, like, how would that age? And then Chris Middleton had a few peaks of the season, but a lot of lows coming off his injury. A so lot. I, he's banged up. He's banged up, too. man. He's on I, the other side of 30, and that's the tough part about this team. The, as far as, like, the cap structure. Mm-hmm. They, yeah. You can't get better. Like, let's say Chris Middleton walks to another team. You know, teams with cap space um, can sign him outright to a max contract potentially. Where do you go if you're the Bucks? You really don't have a choice but to yeah. bring back Chris Middleton and Brooke Lopez, even yeah. if it's for the sake of we can keep you and then we'll trade you, trade you next later. season. Yeah. Or or maybe you sign and trade a guy like that. But then who do you sign and trade him for? Yeah. Can you Like, who can you realistically go get for Chris Middleton right now? So mm-hmm. this team is really – it's they're at a crossroads right now, and I think – the coaching staff is always the first people you can look at. For and sure. I, d- I don't think they would make a quick decision, but there's going to be a decision that, that's going to be made in, in the coming weeks on Mike Budenholzer's future, no question. The yeah. other half to what you were talking about as far as bringing them back is what Kenny was alluding to is the age part. So you may have to overpay and go deeper into the luxury to bring back a guy like Brooke Lopez, and then the, the aging of that contract may not be good mm-hmm. for you know a Giannis who you said only has a couple more years on that contract. Same thing with Chris Middleton. You may have to overpay to bring these guys back, and the value may be that first year and a half to two years of those long-term contracts. And then once once you're in year three or year four of it where you're trying to convince Giannis to stay, those contracts may look unmovable. It may not match in production, and you may be in a position where Giannis has to leave because there's no room to grow and get better for this roster. I I really feel like they didn't take the Miami Heat serious. I think that they felt that they were already etched into the conference finals, and I think based off what I've seen from Giannis um, throughout his career, specifically in that finals against the Suns where it looked like his knee went out of place and he still came back and played, I think they were a little too precautious with his injury because they were thinking long term. We need Giannis to be 100 percent for when we play yeah. the finals. And, and Giannis actually said, I don't know if he was talking specifically about the injury, but he said, you know, they were playing to beat us. We were playing to win a championship. Yes. Yeah, right. and, and I think that confirmed my feelings. And it, it could be like that, too, because I swear they had like at least two, three games, and especially um, game five is just like you have a lead, eight point lead with like three and a half minutes left. 
And it's yeah. like you can't find anybody to get you a bucket. I think Giannis had like an M one or something down the stretch, but it's just like they didn't really have nowhere to go to like offensively. It was just like I think um I wish I would have seen more of just like a Giannis as a as a, a screen and roller instead of just like trying to attack Bam because I felt like Bam was doing his thing on him defensively. Yeah, sure. I would have tried to do at least different look offensively to try to get Giannis close to the rim. It looked like that's when he was at his best when he didn't have to do too much on Bam to just like quick go up, quick buckets. Um but they they just didn't look bad. Like I, I don't see how as a, a team that almost had sixty wins, you were the first seed. It's just like you had breakdowns at those times of the uh sixteen the playoffs. point lead, They're, fifteen Spo, point lead. Coach, yeah. um Budenholzer by circles a mile. around them. And like offensively, the way he used Jimmy in that last game five was phenomenal. He used him like as a screener, a pick and roller. He let Bam bring the ball up the court so that way Jimmy could like set a screen, roll, a pop, like he could make reads off of that. And I thought that was beautiful because, like, now you don't just have Jimmy just trying to ISO. Mm-hmm. It's easier to guard a guy when he's ISO. And we see with Steph Curry, when he's off the ball, he's damn near unguardable. So he used Jimmy as, a, like, a decoy. And we I loved seen, it. We seen uh, Bam run a pick and roll with Jimmy Butler. Setting the screen, yeah. That, <laughs> and, he, and Jimmy and Butler worked. scored on Brooke Lopez in the paint and won. I'm like, this is ridiculous. They had so many players on that roster that we thought were done. Kyle Lowry, done. Gabe Vincent. Robinson. Gabe Vincent saved the Duncan day. Duncan Robinson, done. Kevin Love, <laughs> done. And they all did a little. Okay, just enough. 15 and 7. Enough, right? He did yeah. enough Game for it. Game 6 clincher. The Cavs could have used him. Yeah. yeah, that, <laughs> that's Cavs definitely could have used yeah. him, but they, mm-hmm. you know, they let him go. But j- shout out Jimmy Butler. Shout, shout out Jimmy, Jimmy Butler. Now. He mm-hmm. was saying to, to Drew Holiday, you know, I have 40 on your head. And yeah. it's crazy about that is that Drew Holiday is not a talker. Like Drew, you never see Drew Holiday like yapping or nothing. Drew, Jimmy Butler got into that man here so much. I think he got into all, like the Everybody's entire organization. Yeah. I think the yeah. whole organization is yeah. still. And terrified. I think that's the way you do it. You go after the guy who doesn't say shit. I'm coming at y'all guy. So now you have to stick up for him. You have to be a fan. I'm coming at the nice guy. <laughs> it's easy to go back and forth with it. What are you gonna do? Get into a Jay Crowder? That's that's predictable. I'm going at that guy right there, who's the quiet, nice guy. It wasn't as chippy as I thought it could have been. With it being a, a closer series, wasn't yeah. a lot of not scuffling. You gotta make it chippy if you have the to. Bucks. You, you have like to, especially yeah. when the guy has 56 on you. Mm-hmm. you I thought that's something. where a guy like Bobby Portis, Bobby comes Portis, in and Udonis has, and he played what 10 minutes yeah. in the last and game, score a bucket. And, and uh, speaking of betting, uh, I had a little. <laughs> second half points for Bobby Porter because he plays away. <laughs> How do y'all think the Miami Heat take this momentum into the second round matchup against my New York Knicks? Because I'm confident, number one, in the fact that Jimmy Butler had to do all of that to, to beat the the Bucks, which was phenomenal and, and I and I love it. But at some point he has to get a little bit of exhaustion. Sustain it. Right. Yeah. Sustain it. And they, I'm also curious on Julius Randle's ankle. The yeah, he's huge. gonna be fully hundred. But then again, he didn't play. Well, he did play a lot, but he did wasn't as productive in the first oh, series. Julius Randle, he shot like thirty percent from the field in the first series, and it didn't matter. They yeah. also don't have Tyler Hero. Yeah, um, no we the depot as well. No, all yeah. the depot. We mm-hmm. already were going to win the depth battle, but now you take those two away, and we win it by a long shot. Mm-hmm. And yeah, how much can you depend on Caleb Martin having the game? I don't even. Did, or yeah. I don't even. Uh, Gabe Vincent shot. I wasn't even thinking about them. I think cool. it doesn't get talked about enough, right? Right. Yeah, they the were down f- by what five four? at that point? Four, four. Was it four? Yeah. With mm-hmm. twenty seconds left, and he, he come up court and <laughs> hit a three. <laughs> I'm. Oh, to me, God. my mind is just how effective is Bam gonna be? Because they for for this next year, they're gonna need him to have more than just, like, 12, 13 points in, like, those type of games where he shoots poorly because Mitchell Robinson looked about as dominant as any other center. Against like, two seven-footers. Against two seven-footers. Yeah. Who one was an all-star last year, and the other was third in DPOY. The, the reason I like Bam a little bit more in this series is because he does have the mid-range shot where it can potentially bring Mitchell Robinson out a little bit. And, like, J.A. or Evan Mobley, you don't have to guard those. Yeah. And Bam hit a huge mid-range jump he shot did. down the stretch in that game. And uh, he's been pretty consistent there. So we can maybe pull Mitchell Robinson away from the rim a little bit. But I feel like... Tom Thibodeau is leagues ahead of Bud when it comes to adjustments game by game or even quarter by quarter, um, and that can play a big part. <laughs> T- Tibbs is a goat coach. Yeah. He's, and, and if anyone can come up with a scheme to stop Jimmy, Jimmy. Butler, I mean, they, they have a long, long Yeah, game. they do. We, and we it's know like, about their history. Jimmy, you're going to pretty much be relying on Jimmy, Jimmy Butler heroics because that Knicks team is deep, and he's, you're going to constantly have to fight on offensive boards too. The Knicks just killed the Cavs on offensive boards, and I feel like they're going to bring that same mentality – Against Miami, who's undermanned. Mm-hmm. If you're undermanned, I'm going to try to work harder than you because your stars are going to get exhausted. And then by the fourth quarter come, I could 
Close out the game with Jalen Brunson. Undermanned and undersized compared yeah. to the Knicks, at least. Bam has his work, work cut out for him. Yes, he he, he's got to have a big series. And he was playing with injury, I, I will say. He was dealing with a hamstring injury. So mm-hmm. he balled out, especially in the big game, mm-hmm. yeah. six. But they need him to have a big series. Pull Mitchell Robinson away from the basket. Kevin Love, I think, will be good for them coming off the bench or starting, being able to pull away defenders, the big men. But uh, it'll be a good series. I just – I feel like Jimmy has to be what he was in the first round for them yeah, to have a legitimate so chance too. to win. And the question is, can he can he put up 30, 30 35 points a game? We, we were able to limit a guy who we look at as a playoff riser, which yeah. is Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell, since he came into the league as a rookie in that series against the Thunder, he's been a playoff performer, and we were able to to limit that a lot. And that really surprised me. As a Knicks fan, going into the series on our show, I predicted the Cavs would win because on paper— Wow, that must have been heartbreaking I, for you. I, I, I predicted I, I try it to too. Just not be the, I try to be as non-biased as possible when I'm analyzing. Now, if me and you were at a restaurant, I'm going for my— I mean, You got the jacket on, so you're good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know. um, But— on paper, defensively, how the Cavs were, the size that they had, you expected the size to be a lot better, and you expected Donovan Mitchell to be that playoff performer with a guy like Darius Garland. And to see us limit that and win in five, oh, yeah. man. In the game we lost, they kind of hit everything yeah. in that game, too. So I'm super confident. I think we're a lot more grimier than the Bucks. I think we're going to be a lot more stingier, and I think we're going to be more willing to allow guys like Caleb Martin to beat us. And Kevin Love, you're going to have to have – you know what I was thinking? What were you thinking? We're going to be in Philly. We're going to be in Philly. We have That's Miami around too. the Eastern Conference Finals. If the if the Knicks are there, we should just you, take the train and extend the trip. Right. No oh. brain. We have to. Sure. We, no have brain. To. we we got to do that. Or HOH. Philly. Or in Philly. Yeah. Or in Philly. Yeah. Or in Philly. Yeah. If Philly advances. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. We'll but, see. But yeah, I'm I'm proud of the Knicks. We, I think did we all pick the Cavs to win this I series? I picked the Cavs to win I this series. The I, had, I said it would be a seven-game series. I'm uh, very surprised that it went five. Yeah. But I thought it was going to for sure be a seven-game series. I'm surprised it went five, too. No, Julius Randle, extremely limited. Emmanuel quickly didn't have the I think we overrated years, the – I think the Cavs ended up ninth in offense in the regular season. Their half-court offense was dreadful for the entire series, where if it wasn't them getting in transition or a superhero shot from one of the guards, they couldn't score. Yeah. The spacing – there was negative spacing. What did Jared Allen say after game? The lights were too bright. I like that quote. I like the self-awareness. Too. It you saw it with like Darius Garland, too, mm-hmm. and Evan Mobley. They all were in their first playoff series ever. And they all looked a little starstruck. Yeah. And it just, and it it just seemed like they could never fully all get it together. Like, if it was, you know, Darius Garland came out, had a big third quarter, but Donovan Mitchell struggled that game. Mm-hmm. Donovan Mitchell had a really good game. Darius Garland struggled. They can just never get both their guys to get going at the same game. The second I everybody got to go into this offseason and adjust that wing position some way, somehow. They were I, trying this season. They so. were. And, we got the guy. Josh Hart. <laughs> Josh Thank Hart. God <laughs> they didn't get Josh Hart. Yeah. But it, do y'all think Josh Hart is still the answer for the Cavs? It would have made it a lot better. It would have made it a lot different, but I also feel like they need like that extra shot. Like a guy we even with really DG and Karis LeVert's not the answer for you. No, I that's, Karis LeVert is too much. I, don't of a I love Karis LeVert because he, he he decided to take over some of those games. <laughs> <laughs> Karis LeVert is sometimes <laughs> either forty or like a zero. He feels redundant with the two ball handles that they have. They yeah. need someone that's like specifically. I'm a catch a shoe. I'm a play defense. And Josh Hart changes all of that. Changes all of that, and yeah. he's a demoralizer. Oh, yeah. I'm going to get four offensive rebounds. And it's going to take the heart out of your team. And I think that's going to work for us against a guy like Jimmy Butler. R.J. Barrett wouldn't be enough. I think Jimmy Butler can eat at uh, R.J. Barrett. He won't be able to eat at a Josh Hart. Josh Hart is going to be there. Josh Hart is the worst type of guy to go against. He's the guy that you can embarrass. You can cross him over, make him fall, and he's going to be right back. Yeah. You you, you know, you you like to go at guys. I mean, he's he's the dude that I see the most with the clips where he tries to, you know, dab somebody up and they leave him hanging. He He always got himself. (laughs) He always going to support himself. Embarrassment is not important. He's not worried about that. I need predictions. Seven uh, games, Miami Heat versus the Knicks. Who are y'all taking? How many games? Talk. I'm, I'm betting against the Miami Heat again. Sorry, Jimmy Butler, love you. Yeah. But I, I just don't think is I don't think they'll have enough this time. I think I'm going Knicks in five or six. Mm. I, I think got, I I think got Knicks in five. Yeah. Knicks in five. Damn. I think that depth is gonna be tough. I feel like at some point Jimmy's just Shout gonna out to Obi Top. He's gonna run out of gas, and I, if he I, runs out of gas. Then the whole ship said. You saw him in the bubble. Thanks. He had no gas, and he still kept going. <laughs> yeah. You saw that, that one meme. He had to travel. He didn't have to travel. He had to travel. That, I just want a great series. That's, I mean, that's th- more than anything. Th- these playoffs are going to be, I mean, the second mm-hmm. round is going to be nuts. I mean, you're going to have one of Miami or New York is going to be in the Eastern Conference Finals. No, yeah. I mean, who had that on their, on their yeah. predictions? Having, yeah. an eighth, having a 5-8 second round is kind of crazy. Yeah. We don't really see that often. I don't think we've seen it in our – like time of filming this. No, absolutely not. I think yeah. the last time we saw something like this was 
20, tw- what year is that with Dirk? 20 oh. 2005, 2006? What, what year did Dirk win MVP? The year that they got 2007. 2007. Um, I, be- I believe. Because the other top seed to get eliminated was our Nash Chicago Bulls. 05, 06, yeah. 05, 05 and 2006 back to back. So yeah, I think our, our Chicago Bulls blew a um, series, but that was the, to the, the Sixers, right? That was the year to roll that was towards after ACL. You blew yeah, the knee. Yeah, yeah, yeah you blew the knee out. Yeah. So I like that Sixers team. That don't count. Drew Holiday, Evan Turner. Is Eagle Dollar still on that team? Thaddeus Young. Yes, he is. Yes, Iguodala yes, hit yes. those free throws. Mm-hmm. I think he shot like, you know. A poor free throw percentage all year, and then he makes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, I, I know you remember that, Kenny. We don't want to talk about that series. Yeah, we don't want to. Talk about that. <laughs> That's when Philly started to wear the blue and the red jerseys. That, that was a nice time. Uh, I'm, I'm flattered that y'all picking the bull. I mean, the Knicks in five. I just think Jimmy Butler is a guy that you can't go five. I'm gonna go with Knicks in six. Oh, I thought you were gonna say Miami just now. I thought you were gonna. Knicks in six, man. Knicks in six. We are. Uh, What's we, gonna be going on on Seventh Ave if they win that series? So some oh. shit that I'm Here's gonna be. Here's gonna ha- be there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, no, I don't want to be. A, I don't want to be a part. <laughs> I'm a big Nick fan, but I like to go home. I'm like you. I'm low key. They, I couldn't imagine trying to get home after one of those games. Oh my! Yeah. Oh yeah. Like we if tried you, it. If you and just, it wasn't even a playoff yeah, game. It wasn't even a playoff game. It was a normal regular season just game. Just imagine walking to the arena is way faster than driving. You're yeah. a family guy. You want to take your son and your daughter to the game because they like the Knicks. They're trying to get back home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, you you know. got to give us. Some I type of prediction. I, just, I don't do predictions. Six games, I seven games. I, I, I think I think I think Knicks Miami go seven games. Okay, seven. I games. think it goes seven games. Seven games. I respect that. That'd be crazy. Early in our Eight, like in the garden thing, I used to do no predictions. He was a no prediction. I was a no was. prediction. So I'm taking Kenny's place. Yeah, now. yeah. <laughs> I kind of changed my mind just because. <laughs> who like, cares? Personally, yeah, who cares? it's yeah. not important for I me. I like the fun of it. If you're right, you look amazing. You look brilliant. Even mm-hmm. if you're wrong, it's like. It's, be- it's sports. You're going to be wrong a lot. I understand now. it, though, from, from your perspective, yeah, Shams. Um, I get it. For us, we, our audience isn't that big to, to like, for example, <laughs> no, it, it happened, though, because I was on with Stephen A. Smith, and he asked me about the Knicks, and I said, I'm still going with the Cavs. I got tweeted that three different times as soon as the buzzer ended. Three? I'm surprised it was three. It was only three. Th- um, no, that's probably the, m- the amount you saw. It true. Was probably true. That you multiply <laughs> by sure. 30. Yeah, that's and it had likes and retweets, so you can count those as other people. I had a Cavs well. fan in my mentions yesterday because I picked the Cavs and the Knicks won. It's somebody who reports on the on the Cavaliers, some report was saying that the Cavs feel like they they were the better team and still are the better I saw team. That Ricky Rubio said that. I yeah. Saw yeah. And I was like, nah, how? We just beat you. And the, the <laughs> Cavs fan was like, but P, you picked us. And I was like, so? <laughs> that don't, like, I can pick who was going to win the finals, but like the Bucks was my pick. Are they the best team? No, because they lost. So uh, Yeah, I don't um, I, 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 don't I don't know, know how you can say they were the, they've been the better team. They, they lost to the Knicks five. every game in the regular Ooh. season, right? And then lost in five. And it was convincing, uh, like convincing loss. Well, it wasn't really too. close. Yeah, was, yeah. that <laughs> last really game, series. I literally tweeted these fans paid all those tickets to go to that arena, mm-hmm. and they have nothing to cheer. They for. had no fight. There was, there was no one time in the middle of the third quarter where DG hit a three, and then they got a steal and scored again. I was like, oh, here come the run. It never happened. Yeah, it was all Knicks, all Knicks. Um, quickly, the Suns Nuggets. I guess that's Ooh, this is going to be tough. I do love Jokic. Jokic is saying he's going to pray to be able to defend him in the pick and roll. Love the honesty. Yep. But I'm, that, just for that factor, I'm going to go Suns and Six. I thought you were going to say because he has a Lord on his side, you're going with the, with <laughs> the Nuggets because he prayed. Oh, no. That prayer won't help. <laughs> KD and Devin Kevin, Booker and Chris, Ball, Chris Paul, no. I got it, the Suns in this as well. I think the Suns are going to be too much. Um, they have too much. A part of me, I don't know how to feel because the Suns struggled so much against the Kawhi and Paul George list Clippers. Well, they were one yeah. of the best defenses, even without Kawhi and PG, and the Nuggets aren't nearly that. Right. So you can take, you can look at it that way. I, I've, I've picked the Suns to win the Western Conference, so I'm just gonna stick by that original pick before the playoffs and say Suns and whatever number. Um, but I do believe it's a numbers game, too, because the Nuggets are going to get up a ton more threes when the Suns do not shoot threes. Yes. Also, the Suns are not a team that attack the basket as much as they probably should, and they have an open paint. We saw Anthony Edwards. Rudy Gobert had an amazing offensive series against them, and Rudy Gobert, we know, you know <laughs> I'm not going to say. But <laughs> the Nuggets lack that interior defense, and they also shoot a lot of threes, and the Suns don't. I, I'm still going to kick stick with the Suns, but it wouldn't be like a surprise to me if the Nuggets end up winning this series because of the three-point shooting um, against the Suns. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm leaning towards the Suns. Um, I kind of I – like, I like Denver's chances in it, though. You know, I feel like Jokic has just been – like he – I feel like he might have had the easiest first round in terms of like he just kind of chilled. You know, I feel like a lot of stars, they had got banged up, they had injuries like that, but he's just been kind of cooling. 
Um, I think he's in for a really big series. He said uh, a couple years ago, like, DeAndre Aiden's the, the best defender on me or something like that. Because he can defend him one-on-one, like, straight up, and a lot of teams don't do that, and DeAndre yeah. Aiden has done a decent job at it. But it's just, like, the way that they've been running their offense and, like, the, the acquisition they got through the summer, uh, through the summer I just trust them. You know, I feel like Aaron Gordon has been really good. Yes. You're going you're gonna to have, obviously, I think that's, like, the, the matchup for Kevin Durant. Mm-hmm. KCP on book. KCP on book, who I like to. Obviously, you're not. Or Jamal Murray. Um, <laughs> Jamal Murray over under 30 points per game is Tory Craig guarding him or a Kogi. Tory Craig has the whoever's starting nice. in that spot. Kogi can defend now. Yeah, but one of those 30 guys. 30 points over under. But you know what? Book has turned himself into like a yeah, really or good yeah, defender. Yeah, it might be Devin Booker too. But do you want him to exert no, that much energy? I don't. You know. But then again, you do got Kevin, so maybe you can't afford to have Devin Booker exert True. a lot of energy. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But I do feel like they're probably gonna let a Kogi and Tory Craig probably handle it. Who has the coaching advantage? I, I think so too, and I oh, think that's okay. really going to be the key. I think you know, listen, all I'm rooting for is great series. I'm not going to give a prediction, but <laughs> I think Jamal Murray. I saw that team in the bubble. I saw how good he was. He's back to being that guy, and I yeah, think a lot of people want to say this is just bubble performance. Is he just the guy that's going to do well in the bubble? Uh, like that year that he tore his ACL, they got Aaron Gordon. I think they were. I I think. I hate making predictions, but you know I'm good at hindsight 2020. <laughs> I think that team was like bound for the finals. I that think year. so too. Um, I think it was Clippers. Who did the Clippers play in the fi- Clippers Suns in the finals? Yeah, mm-hmm. like I think Denver could have potentially beaten both. That was a team that that didn't have Kawhi Leonard in the in the conference finals. Mm-hmm. So Denver was right there when they got Aaron Gordon. Jamal Murray was playing at such a high level before the ACL tear. I think I can't wait to see him in this. Michael setting. Porter Jr. has been on fire too. MPJ has yes. been playing well. He might be the greatest fit you can have to a guy next. His to His fourth quarter seven was ridiculous yeah. in the last series. Aaron I like Gordon. KCP. Really good defense. Bruce Brown off that bench. They, they got, got a lot they of got a deep team. Mm-hmm. All that being said, it's just like when it comes down to that fourth quarter and you know you need buckets, Kevin Durant and, and Devin Booker, they're going to get it done. They speak for themselves, so I didn't just do get it speaking for <laughs> They just get it done. Yeah. So it's hard, to, it's hard to like picture scenarios where, because I think this is going to be like a six or, or seven game series. That's how I think I it's going to be tight. I think it's going to be tight games. I might have to just go with like the guys that I know probably gonna close it out. Let's get know? seven games. Chris Paul has been having his little flashes too. The first round. Let's just get seven with everybody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the last one after this would be what the Celtics and the Sixers. So Celtics Sixers. The oh, South of Joel man. Embiid. That's gonna be the big question. Yep. Across. It's what are hard your to even think saying? about the series. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think. I think there was. I think there's been a level of optimism that Joel Embiid will be ready for Game One, okay. but I also, you know, with a knee sprain, when we know that his body injuries, I, I really think it's 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 up in the air right now. And I saw a report that he's gonna have to wear a knee brace if he does, if he does, go. does play. Yeah. Let me ask you this question: What are the conversations around the Philadelphia 76ers if they lose this? Is the excuse of Joel's knee enough? Or are we going to see significant changes, whether it's Doc Rivers? We know the James Harden. I know your sources are talking about the Rockets probably. <laughs> We've been seeing that. What What is the state of the six, Sixers? Because I feel like the last – I'm a guy who's felt like the last four, maybe, yeah, four years, the Sixers have had an excuse. Joel Embiid has had an excuse. A lot of it is, was the Ben Simmons stuff. You, before that, it was Brett Brown, um, it, you know, Doc Rivers. Or uh, last year, they – Joel and B said James Harden is the same James Harden. We need to accept it. What is is is, is <laughs> the is ball didn't get back to James Harden? Don't forget. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, one of the most ball dominant players. But what is the conversation around the Sixers if they don't do what they're supposed to do this year? I'm 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 interested to know that part. Well, I I think you know the Joel and injury, the injury. You know, if if he ends up missing time in the series and they lose, that throws a wrench in a lot of stuff. But I think. Going into these playoffs, getting to the conference finals was definitely a goal for the Sixers. Getting to the NBA finals, it's a goal of the Sixers. And um, given, you know, James Harden's going to be a, potentially be a free agent this summer. He's got a player option. What happens with his future? And I think a lot was dependent on this year. They went into this year with championship aspirations. Mm-hmm. And so if once again you don't make it to the conference finals, you don't get to the NBA finals, they're going to have, I mean, the, the same conversations that are happening in Milwaukee. When you talk about Mike Budenholzer's future, when you talk about, the future of their free agents. That's gonna the same conversations are gonna happen in Philadelphia. And I think, you know, you have another year of of a you know disappointing ending in terms of your expectations. And I think you know they're, they're, they're gonna they're gonna look at you know the future. And I think it's gonna start from the organization. You know, I think everyone wants to talk James Harden. Where's he gonna go? What's right, he gonna right. do? But I think how far they go in the playoffs, what happens after if if they lose in the second round, what happens with the coaching staff, what happens 
around that situation, that's all going to play a factor into James Harden as well. It, hypothetically speaking, they lose in five games to the Boston Celtics in the series. What's the percentages that you think James Harden would be a sixer next year? I don't want you to make a prediction, but what would you – Feel the percentage. <laughs> I mean, listen. Every everyone's free agencies until until it's free agent day. Everyone's fifty fifty on everything, okay. right? Like I think you say that about any free agent, right? Mm -hmm. Because you still have a you know month and a half. Uh, you know, if the if if this series ends in mid May, like you're gonna have a month and a half before free agency starts. So, yeah, you're gonna have an open mind and anything. And technically, he has a player option, so literally True. he is fifty fifty True. on on it. But I think a lot of it will will depend on what do you do organizationally. What are you going to do to win basketball games? Because I do think part part of James Harden, you know, he wants to win. And I think yeah. um, he needs to win. Yeah, yeah, that's why. I mean, we thought the whole mission was like, you know, during the summer when he took the pay cut, he said that like he was working on his body. Like these were just new things we, we were yeah. hearing about James Harden. We were like, oh, he's taking this this uh, this season serious. You know? James Harden won a championship. His legacy goes up to a whole different level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we just being honest. Maybe you're in a, a, a finals run post OKC would do him some justice. So I think that's going to be big. Do y'all have the Sixers or the Celtics? I got I got the Celtics. Based on the lack of knowledge on how Joel Embiid's going to look, I'm going to go with Celtics. Even though the Celtics didn't convince me too much in their last series. Yeah. I feel the like the season. Sixers oh, also. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the Sixers also didn't convince me. They both. Seem like they didn't convince. The I see. I know what you series. mean. Even though it was yeah. a four, yeah, it, it was feel a four like games. The Nets hung around a lot. Too. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, the Nets were right there, and yeah. it seemed like they had the right scheme around Joel and B to like slow him down. So like, the Celtics having the right bodies to do kind of like similar things. The thing. Celtics have seven starters, and they it's gonna be hard for the six. And I think it's gonna be hard for the Sixers. To I just go. got a notification. Joel and B. Doubtful for game one. Oh, man. Bro, against broke the, the news Celtics. right here on through the wire, baby. <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> That's hilarious. He, he, he did not practice today. Okay. And so when you're two days away from from a game, and you he has an LCL sprain. It's a ligament sprain. Mm -hmm. And injuries like that, they can take two to four weeks. I got to so quote the tweet. I'm sorry. I am too. <laughs> Live on through the wire. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> no, any knee injury, especially for a dude of the size, is just scary because it's just the possibility of re-injuring it or aggravating it is just, I feel like it's always so high. Yeah. Especially, wow. he, he all, he's always on the floor, too. And th that's another thing. It's just like, man, you're almost looking like you're asking to get hurt with all this type of, uh, all this contact, and he falls, and he kind of flops with it. It's just like, come on now, Joel B. You six, <laughs> you you seven foot, 260, and you got a little dude that's like 180 pushing you onto the ground. Um. Is that game tomorrow? I think so. Monday. Yeah. Monday. Oh, Monday. Monday. Game one, Monday. S Knicks tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Knicks yeah. tomorrow. We got the Kings Warriors Sunday. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Tonight is Suns yep. uh, Nuggets. And then Monday is uh, Philly Boston. I think that's the only game. I love that we got no gaps. Let's just keep it going. No one yeah. day with no games, man. Mm -hmm. Um well, Shams, man, we appreciate you coming on to the show, you man. You this know, we, 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 we talked about some news. We talked about life. We talked about these series. So <laughs> we even got a broken appreciate news. Appreciate you guys. Appreciate broke you guys news through the, the wire, baby. Overdue. Shout out Chicago. Shout out through the wire. This feel good because now when we go to Summer League or another All-Star, we have another familiar face that we'll be able to connect with. And we'll hang out. We'll you'll hang out at some You'll see us at Summer League. We'll be there. Let's kick it. Yeah. We'll kick it for, for sure. sure. Or the NBA Combine. We're supposed to be oh, yeah, the draft too. Combine. Are you going to be at the Combine? I will be at the combine. You guys gonna be out there? Yeah, yes, we will. Will, will. will and Dylan. Yeah, I'll be yeah. Will and Dylan sure. too. In the shadows, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Thank yeah, man. man. Another episode of Through the Wire, a legendary one. We got news broken live on the show. That's man. that's 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 Beautiful. a bucket list type thing that you didn't even know was on your bucket list. <laughs> right. Um, we appreciate you. Appreciate you. Anytime brother. you want to come back. The seat, oh, the God. king seat is there. Appreciate you, brother. Um, <laughs> thank you. We out through the wire. Peace. Peace.